Welcome, everybody, to episode 118 of Radicalized True Survives podcast. We are bringing back our very good friend, Keir Giles. He, of course, wrote Russia's War on Everybody. His latest book, Who Will Defend Europe, is filled with some tough and prescient medicine. Here's that conversation. Oh, my gosh. Welcome, Keir Giles. We are so happy to have you return to RadPod. Um, we still feast off of your previous interviews. Unfortunately, they've proven time and time again prescient and accurate. Um, so I just finished reading your new book, Who Will Defend Europe? And it's my favorite horror story. <laughs> uh, truly, um, you know, when, when we met in the UK in July and you told me that you believed that Trump was going to be reinstalled back in the White House, um, that to me was a horror story moment and that's what happened so why don't we start there the book is called who will defend europe and we have now had this momentous election and let's just start there sure <laughs> well yes i the as we were discussing just now just before we started recording it's come as a huge surprise to so many people across europe that the united states has held the presidential election as though this came out of the blue and had never been scheduled and furthermore that donald trump was running to be president and look at that wow who could possibly have thought that he would put his name into the ring uh, after so many warnings and so much time that's been wasted, now European governments are confronted with the reality that they fa have to face up to their own responsibilities for protecting their countries and their societies and their civilians uh, because they've neglected that for so long. And now it's been shown up by a president of the United States who appears ready to finally make good on all those threats to pull away the American security blanket that they've been relying on for so long. So that leaves all of us over on this side of the Atlantic in quite a lot of danger because you've got Russia that is looking for its next victim in Europe and Donald Trump promising to end the conflict in Ukraine so that Russia will be more ready to take them on. Thank you so much for that. And we are living once again, I'm quoting your book, where brute military force will determine the lives and futures of millions of people across the continent what is the feeling right now in Europe and what are people doing to mobilize? Or is it like literally you once again telling people, hey, you know, you needed to be prepared and here's what you need to do? Well, for once, it's not just me. Uh, now, Europe, of course, has a lot of different varieties within it. And there's always been this gradient across the continent from the frontline states that understand the problem and now have been investing solidly in dealing with it, the ones that are neighboring Russia and have that folk memory of what it means to come under Russian domination. So we'll do anything to prevent that happening again. They are the ones that are throwing money into rearmament and into civil defense to protect individuals and civilians. But then you go further west, and that's a, a phrase that recurs in the book. I talk about the countries west of Warsaw, the ones that have not woken up to this. You have an understanding across the continent, among anybody that's paying attention, that the danger is rising, but it doesn't penetrate the top levels of the political decision-making classes to actually get something done about it. And that, strangely enough, is a pattern that replicates across several different European countries. You've got uh, defense ministers and armed forces ministers and service chiefs all talking about what needs to be done, but it is the president or the prime minister or the finance minister, the person that would actually press the button to do something about it that doesn't do it. And so we have a situation where more and more people are fully understanding just how much danger we're in, but the action is still missing. Can you just tell us a little bit more about what the next targets might be um uh by by putin um you know i think i think you know it, it's clear that he's moving in in certain directions and i have my own thoughts but i'm very curious to uh, and i've read the the book but uh, curious uh, to have you talk a little bit about what you think the next his next steps might be well, I'm very deliberately not specific about that in the book because this is a fast moving and fast developing situation. And of course, one of the byproducts of the fact that countries like Poland have reinforced their armed forces to such an extent, they've gone on this shopping spree, this crash rearmament program, 
they're not a soft target. They're making themselves a hard target, and that means that Russia is likely to look elsewhere. So the dynamics are shifting all the time. And where might actually be somewhere attractive for, for Russia to move next is also shifting as a result of that. But one thing that's been very noticeable in the, the more recent assessments of what Russia might do in order to challenge NATO and the West as a whole is the way in which these old scenarios of a fait accompli, a so-called fait accompli in the Baltic states have resurged. This idea where Russia could move forward, say, 20, 30 kilometers into one of the Baltic countries, dig in and say to NATO, come and get us and we'll nuke you if you do. At which point, of course, uh, the theory is the NATO alliance evaporates in a puff of nuclear intimidation. And therefore, NATO doesn't actually fulfill its function and therefore it evaporates and each individual country is left at the mercy of Russia thereafter. Now, that's a, a scenario, that's a kind of development path that was very popular in the previous decade because it seemed very realistic after the seizure of Crimea that that could be a next move. This relative military vacuum that was existing in the Baltic states at the time next to a rapidly rearming Russia. But then they disappeared off the table because NATO did the right thing. It set up the so-called enhanced forward presence in the three Baltic states and in Poland, multinational contingents from lots of different NATO nations, so that if there was a crisis with Russia, there didn't have to be a conversation about whether those nations would turn up because they were already there. So suddenly, at a stroke, all of these scenarios about Russia challenging one of these countries disappeared off the table. Why are they back now? Because of Russia's demonstrated aggression and the fact that they uh, they appear not to be intimidated by a NATO response to the extent they once were. But more than that, this suggestion that in fact the US commitment to European security might not be as solid, watertight and unquestionable as it has been in the past. And that leaves an opening for Russia. Thank you so much for that. Just a quick dovetailing on Jim's question. I looked at some recent polls out of Canada. They were grim. Um, I am looking at what uh, what might be uh, happening um, in the EU and how they might be targeted. And what has happened here is a lack of leadership and acknowledgement about the impacts of psychological warfare. We know that Russia is excellent at psychological warfare. And in a report that I did with you called Nuclear Willy Waving and the Long Screwdriver, it was very clear that our own unhealed issues in America over racism, over misogyny, what have you, get amplified, further wedging people apart. And clearly, we've seen millions of people vote against their own democratic governance. When you look at the tactical uh, approach that Russia might take, what do you think will happen on the information warfare front? Because I think that is a big component of all of this. It absolutely is. And of course, it's a reminder that Russia doesn't actually necessarily need to roll tanks across the border to capture a country. They can put their own people in charge of the country and therefore direct its policy and decide what it does to favor Russian interest. And we've seen that not just in the United States, but also look at what has happened, for example, in Georgia, where you don't need to, to rig an election if you've got a ruling party that has made sure that the election is, is only going to go one way anyway and is busy shutting down the opposition. Uh, if you put a pro-Russia party in power in any of these countries, that is the direction it is actually likely to go. And of course, that ties in with the, the promises that we've heard from Trump that uh, now that people have voted for him a second time, they won't ever need to vote again. It's precisely the same pattern. Hi, Fidelity. So, uh, so my question for you is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a very simple man. And I view what is occurring right now is that Putin ultimately wants the globe. He wants liberal democracy eradicated. He wants his people in power in every country he can control. He, he, he is a baboon bearing his fangs at the rest of the world, as you said, waving his nuclear willy. Do you feel that the recent decision by uh, the United States, France, Germany to allow uh, missile strikes into Russia is the Western world finally starting to bear its fangs back or is it too little too late? 
It's certainly too little. It's certainly exceptionally late. But what the reasons are behind this uh, this last minute decision by the Biden administration, and let's not forget, it's the United States' decision that has unlocked suddenly what the UK and France can allow Ukraine to do with their own weapons that are reliant on US technology, a whole other separate issue that's causing panic attacks across Europe when they realize their dependence on the United States. We don't know what the rationale behind it is, because as yet there hasn't been any coherent explanation by the Biden administration for why these things are suddenly happening. The the slight easing of restrictions on um, where you can fire ATACMs into, the uh, the loan um, forgiveness, which was, uh, of course, a byproduct of the fact that um, Congress stepped on the hose of aid to Ukraine for so long, um, the release of anti-personnel mines, etc. It's all happening. But the closest we get to any understanding of why it's happening is, again, these anonymous leaks to U.S. media, presumably by people within the administration that think this is a terrible idea and want to give Russia as much warning of it as possible. Because really, the the first clue that Russia ought to have had that ATACMs were now freer for use was when they suddenly started landing in areas that they still thought was a U.S. mandated safe zone. Instead, they get these uh, these back channel warnings of what's going to happen so they can prepare accordingly. So we don't know why it's happening. Uh, and Ukrainians and people who back Ukraine have every right to be not only glad that these decisions have finally been taken, but also sickened that it has taken the political change in the United States for them finally to be approved. You can't help but think about how many Ukrainian lives, not just on the front line, but women and children behind the lines in the cities would have been saved if these decisions had been taken more promptly. Thank you so much for that. Um, the public is willfully underinformed throughout the West. Um, that is something that you repeat in your book. and. I believe it's been cheap petrol that has delayed effective actions and sanctions over and over again. But why do you think leaders continually act and have been acting like it's someone else's problems, it's not so desperate, and sort of dialing down this looming threat? And maybe, because right after you mentioned that in the book, you bring in a World War II analogy, so this might be the place for people who need some sort of framing. But, but why? Why has it, why has the desperation not been there until maybe this moment, this post-election moment in America? There are a lot of different reasons why European politicians have been in denial about this. Partly, it's politically inconvenient because it upends a lot of their assumptions about how you manage a country and what your spending priorities are. But also, it takes a leap of imagination because this is a situation which is unknown, unheard of throughout the entirety of their education and their political life. This American underpinning, this underwriting of defensive Europe, which has been effectively in place for 80 years, far longer than any of these people have been in their jobs, is now uh, not no longer something that you can take for granted. That is unimaginable situation, number one. Number two is the return of a megalomaniac autocrat who is intent on territorial expansion in Europe. That's supposed to be something that is the stuff of history, the, the 19th and the 20th centuries, Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin, and so on. And yet here it is roaring back again. And that takes an adjustment of mindset and an adjust, adjustment of understanding of priorities that is becoming that is coming extremely difficult for some of the politicians who are confronting the problem. And so the problem is not confronted until it is shoved in their faces by, for example, the re-election of Donald Trump. Even then, sadly, if the past performance is anything to go by, we may not get the action we need. Because how many alarm calls have there been in Europe over the last 20 years? And how many of them had this snooze button hit on them? I worry that, again, it might be more convenient to ignore the problem and hope that it will be somebody else in charge by the time it bites. Um, uh, as I'm sure you know, the, it's been reported that an ICBM was used uh, on Dnipro. Um, uh, to, it obviously did not have a nuclear warhead. Um, but seems clearly to me to be effectively psychological warfare to you know, tell Ukraine, hey, we can nuke you anytime we want. Um, uh, I just wanted to hear you, you talk a little bit about kind of how that nuclear fear, um, you know, affects um, these these sorts of, of decisions and and kind of 
in my view at least leads to a lot of this inaction um, because there seems to be this kind of existential threat um, looming over the whole uh, conflict. Well, first of all, the missile itself. Yes, this is a psychological weapon because the military utility of it is close to zero. And it's not even a particularly effective weapon for killing innocent civilians and destroying their homes. There are much more efficient ways that Russia can choose of doing that. But the target audience for this is not in Ukraine. It is Ukraine's backers across the West. And in particular, it's those people within the US administration and within the United States more broadly who are dead set against supporting Ukraine fully because they argue this will lead to some kind of devastating response from Russia. This is a gift to them so that they can point at it and say, look, we were right. Russia is escalating. This is dangerous. This is provocative. We must dial back the support for Ukraine instead of ramping it up. So in a way, of course, this is just a continuation of Russia's long-term program of nuclear intimidation. It's simply that over recent months, they found different and more innovative ways of turning up the temperature. You'll have heard, of course, that there, there have been adjustments to what Russia calls the, the fundamentals of state policy in the sphere of nuclear uh, deterrence, which everybody else calls Russia's nuclear doctrine. They've milked that for all they were worth because that's um, that's the discussion they were having back in September very publicly saying, we're going to change this. Now they change it and publish it uh, with the timing in response to uh, to the possible relaxation of these restrictions on NATO ACOMs. There are plenty more tricks up Russia's sleeve that they can use to throw like bones to those people who say there is escalation and it's only Russia that can escalate and this is highly dangerous. It seems to me that there is a failure of imagination upon the part of the leadership. Uh, it seems like they are continually acquiescing to Putin's red lines. Uh, it seems that they are afraid to make a stand against this megalomaniac, as you call him. Um, would it behoove Europe to massively ramp up military production send arms streaming into Ukraine, destroy Putin's meat waves, and end the Kremlin, not just as Putin's reign, but you talk about in your book, the problem is not simply Putin, it is the whole Russian governmental mindset that they've been entrenched in for however long. Well, not just uh, Putin and not just the Russian government, but actually Russian society as a whole, because let's not forget what Russia's armed forces do and the way in which they do it and the impact on innocent civilian victims in Ukraine is something which earns the wholehearted approval of broad sections of Russian society. So yes, it is not just Putin. As for the first part of your question, should European governments ramp up their defense industries, rearm, remilitarize to deal with the threat and first of all, to deal with any Ukraine? Of course they should. That should have been happening for a long time already now. But again, this panic that we have seen across Europe as a result of the re-election of Donald Trump is the realization that now they might actually be confronted with the need to do what they should have done a long time ago, namely meet their own responsibilities. But there are too many governments in Europe that have decided that tinkering with government spending priorities, spending less on welfare and on health and on immigration in order that they can actually afford to provide for national survival is too risky. It's too, more risky to, to adjust what the government is spending on than to risk the, the long-term blighting of the country through losing a war. Why do you believe that public figures are still willing to excuse or applaud Putin now as there were when Hitler and Stalin were also applauded? It depends where those public figures are. Now, elsewhere around the world, outside the Euro-Atlantic area, Russia did an exceptionally good job of gathering influence and gaining friends. And we saw this process happening over the course of, uh, the, towards the end of the, the previous decade. We saw Russia trying to rack up all of these people that were on its side in areas that they previously had never really been particularly interested in, uh, not just across Africa, which is what gets all the attention, but even Asia Pacific, for example, um, small Pacific nations, which Russia was courting to try to get them on side. 
It's in some respects a straightforward numbers game when it's a, a matter of international votes that count. Like in the UN General Assembly, the more people that Russia can buy to vote for them, uh, the less difficulty they have in getting away with whatever it is that they have most recently done. But also we see now the practical effect of that in the support across the board for, for Russia waging a colonialist war of a reconquest, which ought, of course, to be something of which former uh, colonial uh, former colonies in across Africa, for example, would disapprove of. But no, Russia has done such a good PR job that they are fully on board with this. And that's across the board uh, globally. And we shouldn't forget that uh, the whole situation looks very different from south of the equator than it does to us. But across the, the Europe and North American area, yes, you have politicians that will endorse Putin for their own particular gain and for their own particular ideological reasons. And that can be because they stand to profit out of it, or it can be because they have sincerely convinced themselves that actually Putin is in the right. And that's that key difference that we've talked about so many times before between agents of influence and useful idiots the agents of influence that are consciously working on behalf of a hostile power that wants to attack their country, the useful idiots that have convinced themselves that they're doing it out of their own motivations. Yes, and you have seen the projected cabinet uh, suggestions from Trump, and what does that tell you? Well, apart from the, the fact that the, the general theme tends to be send in the clowns, it's also a, a top 10 list of all of the people in that orbit, in that Trump orbit, that are most under suspicion of actually working on behalf of hostile powers against the United States. So if this is not a hostile takeover of the United States, and it is just a pure coincidence, it is an extraordinary one. Yeah, I, I, um, uh, I've, I've been monitoring a lot of, uh, a lot of the propaganda, obviously, and the, uh, what, what I'm seeing um, in large part is a, uh, a realization of Dugan's um, philosophy um, of, you know, uh, multipolarity, right? Bringing down the sort of establishment of the of liberal democracy as the the dominant paradigm. Um, uh, do people in 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 Europe and broadly understand that that this sort of ideology of you know world domination of reordering the uh, post World War II order? is underlying this or do they you know because it, for, for me I, I just see a fundamental lack of understanding of the kind of history and ideology behind this and i'm, I'm just curious if you're um if there's any if that people are realizing kind of what that philosophy is behind this well the realization is growing and not really about the ideology because not that many people have managed to to wade through Dugan's ramblings, but instead right. it's the practical effect that people see, the way in which there's now a coalition challenging the rules-based international order, challenging the West, challenging democracy globally, and the cooperation between the members of that coalition is getting deeper and more solid all the time, and of course more overt as well. China, right. Russia, Iran, North Korea, uh, you see each, uh, Practically every month, there's a new indication of how they are helping each other to challenge the West in their own local area. You've got North Korean troops now uh, joining in the assault on Europe. You've got Russia assisting with attacks on shipping in the Red Sea. You've got China uh, supplying Russia with the weapons. And so it goes on a, a kind of merry-go-round. And we shouldn't be surprised if we see more and more cooperation and more and more mutual support to challenge the West globally. A commander of the defense force of a frontline state told you in May of 2023, we cannot deter Russia through threats of casualties. The only number of Russians to kill that is enough to deter them is all of them. That is a bold statement. But I understand from World War II, the only thing that woke Germans up was the dropping of the Allied bombs on their heads. So how do we buttress the point that he is making? How do we you know, explain that this is not noodling the margins. There has to be definitive action taken to end this aggression or the rest of the world darkens. 
Well, some context. Uh, this um, individual who has now moved on from his post but uh, still can't be identified, this was speaking under the Chatham House rule, was talking about what it takes to keep Russia out. And the, the slight miscalculation that had uh, surprised a number of different countries that Russia was not deterred at all by massive numbers of casualties. Um, the realization that actually the, the calculus that would um, determine any other country's policy in terms of how much costs you can suffer to achieve your objective simply didn't apply to Russia. And therefore, the conclusions, if you're a frontline state, is first of all, that you have to defend every single inch of your territory, because if you leave people under that savage Russian military occupation, this is this is a return to history, and it, it brings dire consequences for anybody that's abandoned there. And secondly, you cannot calculate that there will be a way of deterring Russia short of that open military conflict and short of the clashes, which are catastrophic and devastating for Russia. So the normal calculations of how you might uh, deter another power that's bent on invading you simply don't apply in this case. And that's the reason why he made that particular comment as part of a, a detailed explanation of how his country was preparing to deter Russia and if deterrence fails, to actually keep Russia back as, be as best they possibly could. But overall, uh, yes, the, the realization is sinking in again that we have a generational challenge, that Russia is not going to change until it is changed through external forces, that this determination that they have to expand and to recover what they see as rightfully theirs, which sadly now is the territory of quite a few EU and NATO states, so countries with which we have treaty alliances, is not going to go away until there is that strategic defeat, that strategic setback for Russia that we've talked about so many times before that would actually start the process of Russians reassessing the place of their country in the world. Thank you so much for that. We have been frontline fighters in the information war here in America trying to uh, thwart the threats to reality. And there is another line here uh, from a former commander uh, from a Baltic state we know what happens if we don't fight. If we fight, we may die. If we don't, we die anyway. It feels very existential here in America on many levels. It feels very existential for the world. We've always said this is about Ukraine. How do we let people know that there are no civilians in an information war? That was one of the first lessons I learned from you. And there certainly are no civilians as we're seeing in the kinetic war. What can we tell people? Well, where do we start? Uh, where you stand on this, of course, depends on exactly where you sit, and it affects different people in different ways. Up until now, it seems that the United States has been immune, spared, the kind of arson and sabotage and murder campaigns that have been ongoing across Europe. But it wouldn't take much for that to be brought home to the United States. For the time being, you can imagine that Russia will not want to embarrass Trump. But, of course, that is contingent on Trump actually doing what Russia wants. So let's think, consider a scenario where it is not just the information effects that have such a, a devastating uh, impact on how America governs itself, but it actually steps up in terms of the, the direct attacks as well. Um, the sabotage, the murders, the innocent civilians who are killed across the continent to make a point for Russia. That is the point at which it is too late to wake up to exactly what the challenge is. The frontline states understand this. The rest of Europe is gradually beginning to come to terms with it. But of course, this is not just a European problem. It is a global challenge and the United States is the object of that challenge. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you so much. I have a million more questions. Please come back. High five, final thoughts or Jim, final thoughts. My final question is simply this. Uh, what we were discussing earlier with Jim's question was known colloquially as Pax Americana, right? The post-World War II order. Uh, I would I would offer the fact that Pax Americana has expired. Um, my own thoughts on this are that we need Pax Terra uh, in which all liberal democracies arm themselves heavily. You know, right now, 72% of the planet exists under authoritarian dictatorships. Um, is it time for us to, uh, uh, our options are basically surrender or fight and, and not just fight Putin, but also take on MBS, MBZ, 
uh, Xi, Kim Jong Un, all of it. We we need to start putting our foot down. Do you see the will to power in the leadership of Europe? No. To do that. No, that fight is already underway, and some countries have chosen to actually engage in the fight. Others will either realize too late or not too late that they need to join it, or they may simply decide that rolling over and surrendering is the safer and cheaper option. Kier, who will defend Europe? What can we do right now to give people some sort of action that they can take? Because the idea of rolling is so bleak. Well, if you are in Europe, then this is the time to actually raise a stink with your elected representatives and ask them why they are not pushing for greater defenses against the threat that everybody understands is there. And following the examples of the countries that I describe in the frontline states, the ones that have shown that it is possible to do it, Poland with its crash rearmament program, Finland with its longstanding principles of protecting civilians, protecting society when a foreign power, namely Russia, is trying to to destroy them in order to make sure that the state can continue to function and people can continue to live their lives. There are ways of doing this and those countries show the way. It's time, well past time, for other countries west of Warsaw to emulate them. Thank you so very much, Keir Giles. The book is Who Will Defend Europe? And we have learned so much. I'm so appreciative of your time, gentlemen. Thank you so much, Keir. Just grateful to have you here. Thanks again. Thank you, everybody. Cheers.